Good afternoon. This is the session on the federal agency's address, Emerging Issues and Advances in Addiction Medicine. Our first presenter will be Ms. Kana Anamoto. She is the Principal Deputy Director at SAMHSA. Kana. That was a very speedy introduction, thank you. <laughs> Dr. Bocci, I appreciate it, and I appreciate the American Society of Addiction Medicine for inviting uh, me to be part of this panel. Officially, I think when I first found out that the um, theme was about innovative uh, innovations in research and speeding, um, uh, speeding the creative work of, of addiction medicine, I thought, well, SAMHSA doesn't do that much innovation. Uh, but I was actually quite wrong. We have an amazing team. Uh, uh, and uh, while we don't do a lot of our own research, we don't fund research grants, um, one of our important roles is to find innovative ways to apply that research and data to strengthen the workforce, improve access to care, and enhance quality of treatment for people with mental and substance use disorders. And so um, we've, uh, as I have learned, and you'll see that we've supported some pretty important breakthroughs in behavioral health uh, prevention, treatment, recovery support services, as well as um, we're looking at finding innovative ways that services can be delivered and are constantly looking at the field uh, to see how we can do these things better. So today I'm going to give you a preview of a few projects that we've been working on that reflect both our agency's commitment to and our staff's personal passions uh, for ensuring that research-based knowledge makes a difference uh, in the lives of Americans across the country. And so some of these projects are using innovative delivery channels, others uh, are using information in new ways to address some of the most urgent problems uh, that we face in the addiction field. All of the projects exemplify what can happen when we look at existing issues from a fresh point of view. And and um, that really is what innovation is about. So the, one of the uh, public health issue um, that you all know about, and I'm sure you've discussed broadly, uh, is the treatment of opioid use disorders. We know only too well that our country is experiencing an epidemic of untreated opioid addiction. In 2015, 2.4 million Americans had an opioid use disorder, uh, but nearly 80% of those did not receive specialty treatment. And we know that evidence-based medication-assisted treatment, or MAT, is an effective response. Uh, in fact, it's the most effective response, and it remains significantly underutilized, and that's why I'm really excited to give you the first look at SAMHSA's newest tool to support practitioners in providing MAT for opioid dependency. It's the MATX mobile app. There really isn't anything like MATX in the field today. It represents a significant step forward in our efforts to improve access to medication-assisted treatment, making it easier for you to help your patients living with addiction get the effective evidence-based treatment that can turn their lives around and even save their lives. For example, uh, the app uh, simplifies the process for becoming certified to prescribe buprenorphine. Um, all the information you need about the Data 2000 waiver process, including resources for becoming data waived, increasing patient limits, and updating your information will be at your fingertips with the app. And the app is free uh, on Google Play and the iTunes uh, App Store uh, to put all the critical information to support delivery of MAT in one place. So the latest on treatment approaches, medications, clinical support tools, plus helplines and access to SAMHSA's treatment locators. Um, and here is a sneak peek. Nearly 80% of individuals with an opioid use disorder do not receive treatment. MATX, SAMHSA's free mobile app for healthcare practitioners, supports medication-assisted treatment for opioid use. MATX leads you through the step-by-step -step process to become certified to prescribe buprenorphine. You can also learn about FDA-approved medications and access resources, including treatment guidelines, ICD-10 coding, and recommendations for working with special populations. Easily locate buprenorphine practitioners and behavioral health treatment services and facilities. MATX empowers practitioners to provide effective, evidence-based care. Coming soon. And if you download the app, it will also make you look like a character on Grey's Anatomy. <laughs> so, these are all 
very lovely doctors. Um, so to be notified about the app's release and to learn more about SAMHSA's other MAT-related resources, please visit um, store.samhsa.gov, apps.mat, or just forward slash apps, forward slash mat. Uh, we'll be doing it. There is a table set up outside to do a demo of the app right outside. I've already done it myself. Uh, a lot of very good resources right at your fingertips. You can find naltrexone, uh, o uh, OTPs, as well as uh, mental health facilities and buprenorphine providers all in one place. Um, and be sure to sign up for the October 21st Spotlight on MAT Stakeholders webinar, uh, which is going to be sponsored by ACM and where the release of MATX will be officially announced. So this was just a a uh, uh, heads up preview for you. Uh, the webinar will focus on the benefits of evidence-based MAT for your patients and it will answer practical questions about billing, reimbursement, and more. You'll find out about the full suite of uh, SAMHSA's resources, including uh, more details on the app and CEU units will be, CEUs will be available for the webinar. Another cool innovation uh, that we've gotten, so for years, chains like Starbucks uh, and Wendy's, Petco, GM, they've all used GIS or Geographic Information System Mapping Technology to identify the best locations for their new stores. Uh, we decided to take that technology and harness it for the purpose of helping to identify where new treatment facilities should be located uh, to identify those communities that would most benefit uh, from new resources. So we've developed an evidence-based approach to identifying geographic locations where new MAT programs might be placed. Uh, so the GIS for MAT uses data from SAMHSA's national surveys, both the NISDA and our NSATs, uh, to identify need. We collate, collate those data with existing sites uh, uh, and from our treatment locator, uh, and then we try to identify the communities where there are gaps. So to start, we look at what we could do with the data we could easily access. The next generation of this work could include other sources, uh, private sources such as um, a directory of Vivitrol prescribers and other things. So any organization can use the GIS for MAT data for assisting in decision making around placement. It's intended to be additive to the conversation, not prescriptive. Uh, we started this about a year ago uh, and we've presented it across HHS to our Behavior Health Coordinating Council. And we're looking at um, FDA, IHS, CDC, HRSA, ASPR, and NIH are all involved in uh, helping to vet this. And so we hope to get this out by the end of the year. Another uh, very cool innovation uh, born out of uh, SAMHSA is um, also addressing the opioid overdose uh, epidemic that we're experiencing as a country. Uh, in Akron, Ohio, police reported more than 90 overdoses and eight deaths during a July overdose spike. Uh, in one six-day span this August, there were 174 overdoses reported in nearby Cincinnati. And in our own backyard in Baltimore, they've had a 50% increase. So 920 people died from fatal overdoses just in the first half of 2016. Um, that's a dramatic jump from 2015 when 600 people died all year. Uh, so we, we need uh, our team led by Dr. Mitra Adpour our ASAM member and director of our Division of Pharmacologic Therapies came up with this approach for addressing the problem with a team of SAMHSA employees by linking uh, people using heroin to life-saving resources and information in real time. It's uh, called ROAR, or Rapid Opioid Alert and Response. So Mitra and her team submitted the uh, idea for ROAR to our HHS Idea Lab, which is a department's uh, innovation startup. And we're trying to test the idea that has the potential to transform the way we can deliver on our mission. So we use, Aurora uses real-time monitoring to identify spikes in overdoses and alerts the network of grassroots organizations and individuals that regularly serve and interact with heroin users in the affected area. So the alert will be based on um, uh, 911 calls. Uh, so that the system will pull data from overdoses, uh, from real-time calls to 911 and the Poison Control Center. If calls involving overdose exceed a pre-established probability distribution of over reported overdoses for that area, then an alert will be triggered. So let's say an average of zero to two overdoses occur every day in a given city. If more than two overdoses are uh, observed in one day, ROAR will trigger uh, uh, we'll, we'll trigger an alert. We will check to see if the information is correct. We'll send an email alert to the network of designated contacts for that area. And the network can include health departments, city employees, methadone clinics, first responders. And it will have a one-pager with life-saving information about what to do, where people can find treatment, and it'll be tailored to that local community. And so far, uh, we've piloted this program in two communities, in Baltimore City in May and Anne Arundel County uh, in June. 
And right before our Baltimore pilot ended, the city experienced a spike, and the war uh, system was able to kick in. And while we can't directly attribute our results, the results to war, but in the six days following the alert, there were no additional overdoses. So we started to see a spike going up. Public health officials, treatment officials, community members were alerted, and then we didn't see any more overdoses. So whether or not that was war, we don't know, uh, but certainly it's positive uh, that we didn't have more overdoses. And so we're getting a lot of attention in the Maryland and the eastern region. Um, communities are asking for this. Um, it's agile, portable, low cost, and scalable. So we're looking for ways to expand on the pilot, to build on the body of evidence that will demonstrate that it can be widely adopted and implemented. Uh, and so if you want to learn more about it, you can look on the HHS Innovation Day uh, and search for ROAR, and it is on YouTube. So SAMHSA supports a wide variety of evidence-based strategies, as you can see, for preventing, diagnosing, and treating addiction and co-occurring mental disorders. Um, the projects I've shared with you today are, I think, just a few of the exciting ideas we've been able to work on to make sure that the body of evidence that is developed by our esteemed colleagues at the Institute um, around addiction and, and mental disorders are getting into uh, the, the hands of people that need it uh, and that we are applying innovative approaches to technology and the use of data uh, to make sure that communities are able to respond uh, to these important issues um, in, in a real-time and effective manner so that uh, the men, women, and young people today uh, who need this help are able to get it. Um, so with that, uh, I thank you, and I am going to start my questions. I think this is really fun. I've never done this before, but I know you guys have. In 2015, 60% of Americans with a substance use disorder involving prescription pain relievers received treatment. So you have your clickers. I can't read the numbers. But I think everyone, most of everyone got the answer. It is false, right? It's only 20% of people got treatment. Next question. SAMHSA's newest tool to support practitioners in providing medication-assisted treatment for opioid dependency, MATX app, includes information on the DATA 2000 waiver process, treatment approaches, medications, and clinical support tools, helplines and access to SAMHSA's treatment locators, or all of the above. <laughs> So I think people got it, all of the above. Thank you. Um, so lastly, in SAMHSA's rapid opioid alert and response pilot project, the system pulled overdose data from calls to 911 and the Poison Control Center. True or false? True. Thank you. That's why you guys are doctors. All right. Thank you very much. Right. Our next presenter is Dr. George Koob. George is a friend and former colleague, and he is the current director of the National Institute on Alcohol and Alcohol Abuse. Um, good afternoon, everyone. It's great to see you all. So, uh, if I could have the slides, I'll tell you what I'm going to tell you, which is uh, the priorities that we're planning on uh, pursuing in 2016. So I guess I can do this. I did the wrong one, but that's all right. So basically, I'm going to cover very, very quickly the scope of the problem, um, our strategic plan, the science and prevention uh, highlights science and treatment highlights and science and diagnosis highlights of some of our plans for the next year. <clears throat> um, I don't think I have to emphasize that alcohol abuse and alcoholism are a considerable burden on our society. And, you know, uh, I understand the opiate prescription uh, epidemic, but I, I want to remind you that we lose about 90,000 people to alcohol each year. And only about 
of individuals with an alcohol use disorder get any treatment whatsoever, and less than 10% get any medication. So our overall strategic plan, which is nearly complete and will be put out for public view in the next few weeks, is to identify the basic mechanisms of alcohol action and alcohol-related pathology, to track, prevent, and diagnose alcohol misuse, alcohol use disorder, and alcohol-related consequences, to develop and improve treatments for alcohol use disorder, co-occurring dis co disorders, and alcohol-related consequences, and strengthen the public health impact of NIAAA-supported research. If we haven't covered something you love, then you should tell us, but I think that these four bullets cover a great deal of the mission of our institute. One of the biggest areas of, of emphasis with ourselves and also with the National Institute on Drug Abuse and the National Cancer Institute in the efforts of the collaborative research on addictions at NIH is development. And you know, and I can't emphasize enough, that we now have a biological basis of why you should not uh, change the 21-year-old drinking uh, law. And that is that your frontal cortex and that front end of your brain doesn't fully develop until about the age of 21. So there are frontal cortex changes and track connections to the brain stem that are still changing into the mid-20s. And we know that the negative consequences of drinking in adolescence is profound. I'm not going to read all the, uh, the, the uh, deleterious effects, but, but you know, some of them to highlight are, are assaults, sexual assaults, um, impairment in, in social and occupational functioning, and nearly one million high school students and nearly two million 12 to 20 year olds consume five or more drinks uh, uh, six or more times a month. And built into this that's really insidious is what we're picking up is the good news is there's, and SAMHSA can take a lot of credit for this, but the good news is that there's a decrease in the percentage of underage drinking going on in the United States. But the part that's insidious is there's a dramatic increase in the intensity of binge drinking. And it's not unusual for us to have college presidents tell us that individuals are drinking to blackout. And you remember blackout is when you don't remember what transpired while you were drinking, and it usually takes about 10, 15 drinks to get there. As a result of this, in, um, in, in last fall, we initiated the College AIM intervention uh, matrix, which is a menu for both environmental and individual prevention programs. It's out there to all the universities and colleges in the United States. And you can now legitimately ask a university or college what prevention programs they're engaged in and, um, and, and what programs they're actually utilizing. Um, we also um, have a big program on screening and brief intervention. And I, I think it'd be safe to say that, that uh, screening actually works. And um, we are continuing to monitor how effective this is in, in adolescence, and those data are underway. And the development domain, um, we some years ago initiated a cross-sectional longitudinal design in 800 subjects to follow individuals from nine, uh, I'm sorry, 11 to 12 years old and on up through adolescence and image their brains and engage in neuropsychological testing and follow their alcohol use. Uh, this grew into a much larger study. This study is ongoing. You can think of it in some sense as a pilot study for the, the greater adolescent brain cognitive development study that's now being led by NIDA, ourselves, and NCI. And here we're going to be measuring uh, brain imaging, neuropsychological testing, substances that are being used, and many other variables in nine to 10-year-olds and follow them completely in a prospective design. In other words, these same nine to 10-year-olds are going to be followed for 10 years. It's a massive study. It's underway. Recruitment has already begun. Goal is 10,000 individuals. I've revamped the uh, NIAAA Medications Development Program, taking a page from Frank Voci's early work and the current work of Phil Skolnick at NIDA. And we now have our own little division of medications development in our AAA. We've initiated a number of what I think are innovative programs, emphasis on human laboratory studies. We've revamped our SBI, our STTR program to, deal, to address the valley of death. Uh, I'll speak about that in a minute. 
but that has to do with um, how you bridge the gap between preclinical work and clinical work. And then we have a small group that engages in uh, multi-centered clinical trials with some success. A paper just came out with a successful clinical trial on a vasopressin 1B antagonist. That's an actually an anti-stress uh, medication, and I urge you to look at that. It just came out in the literature. Now, the valley of death refers to the fact that we at NIAAA, and I'm assuming NIDA has a, could put together a similar diagram, have many, many targets at the preclinical level that we could possibly use for treating alcohol use disorders. However, getting those targets from a rat to a human being is the first valley of death. And that means you have to get an IND. And that's why we, with NIDA, um, have revamped our SBIR, STTR programs to address um, uh, that challenge. The, the other challenge is, of course, after you have a phase two clinical trial, is to gay engage the pharmaceutical industry and biotech into moving on to uh, trials that will actually result in, uh, in a medication being brought to market. And finally, I, I just want to mention something that we were very excited about. We call this the Addictions Neuroclinical Assessment and Neuroscience-Based uh, Framework for Addiction Disorders in the Diagnosis range, uh, Domain. We're intending within the intramural program at NIAAA and uh, is to uh, start measuring a number of different tasks that can reflect executive function, negative emotionality, and incentive salience, some of the three key domains that we associate with the addiction cycle. And we're going to be using things like stop signal reaction tasks, if some of you are familiar with that, or delayed discounting. These are executive functions. Uh, we'll have uh, pleasure scales and dysphoria scales. And we'll have tasks that, that measure Q reactivity and, and uh, other domains that are associated with uh, incentive salience. The hope is that such a, a profile of neuropsychological measures can aid in the diagnosis of alcohol use disorders, maybe ultimately identify subtypes of alcohol use disorders that are more amenable to certain treatments than to others. And those treatments, I might add, don't include just medications. I'm a firm believer in behavioral treatments, but I would like to know what behavioral treatments are more effective for what subtypes or endophenotypes of alcohol use disorder. Finally, we had a biosensor challenge um, that was successful. Backtrack has produced uh, something that looks like uh, the iPhone watch that can actually measure blood alcohol levels online. This is going to allegedly be marketed later this fall, and we're about to initiate a new uh, 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 challenge to use other techniques. This uses a biocell. We're hoping that there may be other measures that could be used that will be equally or even more effective in measuring online blood alcohol um, most of you are familiar with the SCRAM device that you've seen actresses wear or actors wear in People magazine. It's a big clunker thing. We're hopeful that the uh, backtrack device will be a little more sexy and a little more uh, appreciated. Other priorities, and I'm just going to list these quickly because I'm very quickly running out of time. We have a major effort in prevention health services research. Um, I want to put in a lot of energy in recovery from alcohol use disorder. We have very little knowledge about the neurobiology, the effectiveness of different treatments, um, even the impact of diagnosis on recovery. Um, aging is, uh, as the population ages, alcohol use disorders in the aged population are an important uh, area that we need to revisit at the Alcohol Institute. And then we are planning on integrating addiction medicine training in primary care and prevention care and develop an addiction core curriculum for medical students. We're doing this in collaboration with um, SAMHSA, ONDCP, NIDA. Um, this is a big effort ongoing now. We have a lot of resources. One of the more popular ones that I always use when I talk to the press is rethinking drinking. Um, but College Aim is out there. Uh, there, and we're planning an NIAAA treatment navigator, so stay tuned for that. should be maybe later this year, early next year. So thank you very much. Now I guess I'm supposed to move on to questions. I exited. I guess you guys are going to set it up. The frontal, 
The front, well, you know what the question was. The frontal cortex of the brain is not fully developed until the mid-20s, true or false? How come I got the dirge? <laughs> and this is true, of course. Which of the following characterizes the National Institute on Alcohol Abuse and Alcoholism's College AIM Intervention Matrix? Provides a listing menu of effectiveness of both environmental and individual prevention programs. Provides a listing menu of, effect of relative costs of both environmental and individual prevention programs is applicable to colleges and universities, all colleges and universities in the United States. D, all of above. That's a little better. And you all got that one too, it's, it's D of course. And finally, which of the following accurately describes the NIAAA neurobiological heuristic framework of the stages of the addiction cycle guiding medications development and guiding an addiction neuroclinical assessment approach to diagnosis? Binge intoxication, withdrawal negative affect, preoccupation anticipation, binge intoxication, withdrawal negative affect, craving, relapse, sensitization, incentive salience, withdrawal negative affect, preoccupation anticipation, impulsive compulsive craving. This is actually a hard one, so let's see how you do. It, the answer is A. We'll bring this one back next year, too. All right, thank you very much. Our third presenter is Dr. Wilson Compton. Wilson is the deputy director of the National Institute on Drug Abuse and also a friend and former colleague. Well, thank you, Frank, and good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to be with you on behalf of the National Institute on Drug Abuse. Uh, and uh, Dr. Volkov sends her greetings. She's sorry she's not able to join you and asked me to provide some comments about our work at NIDA. So what I've selected for you, if I could have the slides, please. Uh, focus is first on how we think about, well, I have disclosure information. Actually, none of those are mine, so we will just ignore them. Uh, the, uh, 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 the, the, the way I think about addictions and the way we would focus on it at, at NIDA would be addictions as a disease of gene environment by development. And you already heard some information from Dr. Kube about the importance of development, the lack of brain development early completion until at least the mid-20s in terms of the frontal lobe connections to the mid-brain centers. But fundamentally, I always approach this from, you know, we were often taught it's either nature or nurture. It turns out that for, for these conditions, it's the combination of the two and the interactions. What makes it even more uh, uh, complicated and frankly interesting is that these interactions vary across development. So the family environment being particularly important very early in development, early in, in uh, uh, puberty and adolescence, but the neighborhood and peer environment taking over in terms of its importance as uh, uh, adolescents grow and develop. So that's part of our heuristic and how we would approach the overall concept of studying drug abuse and addiction from a, a, a time-specific and a, a environment and a intrinsic nature as well. So I thought I'd highlight for you three areas where we think science can inform policy and practice where they're particularly needed. This, of course, is not our full portfolio at all, but represents just a highlight to, uh, I hope, keep your attention and pique your interest in some of what we're trying to support at the National Institutes of Health at NIDA to uh, stimulate greater knowledge to prevent and treat these complicated, uh, serious conditions. Number one would be around marijuana and how the shifting legal and social landscape uh, creates possible population impacts and our need to both study this and then where possible uh, suggest uh, new promising approaches. Second is a new product that's been on the market just for the last few years that while it seemed promising for adults who struggled with uh, uh, stopping their cigarette smoking with other nicotine replacement approaches, 
uh, has taken the, the adolescent world by storm in the last few years. And of course, opioids as a key area. When I looked through your agenda, I saw at least uh, uh, the cannabinoids and opioids highly reflected in the agenda over, the, uh, over this entire meeting. Nothing on e-cigarettes, so I thought I would add that to the mix here. Now, very briefly, why do we consider this important? When we think about uh, marijuana, we've seen some nice positive changes over the last couple of decades when it comes to overall use of alcohol. As Dr. Kube mentioned, this, this distorts the picture because we're not really looking at some of the most serious, uh, dangerous practices when it comes to heavy binge drinking. But overall, we have some improvements in youth uh, alcohol and certainly tobacco use. Marijuana is a different story. Marijuana is now more commonly used by youth in America than uh, uh, tobacco and is approaching the prevalence for alcohol. So that's number one, why we think the marijuana area is so important. When it comes to e-cigarettes, it's the youth issues that are, are so important. We were surprised about a year and a half ago when our high school survey, Monitoring the Future, first broke the news that e-cigarettes were more common than combustible cigarettes for eighth, 10th, and 12th graders. Uh, and even when you look at kids that have never used another tobacco products, e-cigarettes are quite commonly used by those kids. Now, does this matter? Yes. It's not just a passing issue, but uh, there's now longitudinal work to suggest that those who are initially exposed to e-cigarettes will transition to combustible tobacco, which of course is the most worrisome pattern. In addition to understanding those overall patterns, flavored products seem to be a key factor in driving this. So we're partnering with the Food and Drug Administration for a series of studies to look at how their regulatory authority over tobacco might be brought to bear here. With this focus on adolescence, I'm reminded of our flagship study that uh, Dr. Kube mentioned to you already, the Adolescent Brain Cognitive Development Study. We hope this will be a landmark study. It's certainly a very large, complicated effort that includes recruitment of some 10,000 9 and 10 year olds. Why are we starting 9 and 10? We want to talk to them and assess them with full MRI scans and a full neuropsychiatric assessment prior to the initial exposure to alcohol, tobacco, marijuana, and other substances. One of the key drawbacks in many of the studies to date is that they take place after exposure, so you're always left wondering, did the substances cause these, cause these changes or is associated with the changes or was it a pre-existing difference in the populations? So this is a way to address that major methodological concern. Uh, it's also a large enough sample that we'll be able to look at subgroup variation and we'll learn a tremendous amount about normal growth and development of the brain. That's part of the reason we have so many partners in this effort from across NIH. So the National Institute of Mental Health, the National Institute of Neurological Diseases and Stroke, the Office of Behavioral and Social Sciences Research, the uh, National Institute of Minority Health uh, and, and uh, Health Disparities are among the partners, of course, NCI because of the combined focus on all the substances. So stay tuned, we expect this to lead to some really exciting new information over the ensuing years. So that's number one and number two, particularly focusing on the adolescent development and the adolescent brain. The third topic will be the opioid issue. And you all are aware, aware, well aware of the epidemic of overdose deaths. What I have graphed here for you here are the deaths related to opioids in particular, but I would suggest to you that this is probably an underestimate because many of the death certificates, uh, while they will code for a drug overdose, they often don't specify what substance was used. So many of those cases of drug overdose also represent opioid-related deaths. Uh, these are staggering numbers. While they are much lower than the number of deaths associated with tobacco and alcohol, it's the market increases in the last 10 or 15 years that have garnered so much attention. We've seen the changes in many areas of the country. Of course, it's not universal, but we see remarkably broad impact in rural populations. That's why I'm very pleased to announce that just yesterday, we issued an RFA in conjunction with the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, and another organization that I only learned about a couple of years ago, the Appalachian Regional Commission, who have joined with us to support uh, demonstration projects to uh, uh, address the opioid issues in rural populations. We hope that these can be model programs to address some of the services systems issues as well as the complicated social factors uh, that are related to opioid misuse and the devastating complications of that problem in, the, in rural communities. 
I'm really pleased that NIDA has been able to partner with multiple agencies. You heard uh, Dr. Inamoto mention a group called the Behavioral Health Coordinating Council, the BHCC, this Behavioral Health Coordinating Council, has been implementing priorities for the Secretary of Health and Human Services related to opioids for the last several years. We're focusing in three areas. The first will be prevention, prescribing practices, the upstream driver being too many prescriptions, so we need to change those practices. The second being focusing on saving lives acutely with naloxone, and the third, medication-assisted treatment. I'm very pleased that NIDA has collaborated with industry to help develop an intranasal formulation of uh, 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 naloxone. So we now have on the market a, uh, a nasal spray version of naloxone, accompanied by as well the auto injector. So we now have novel formulations that should be available to all the patients and all the members of public and first responders that need these to help save lives. Now, of course, the other major theme has been focusing on, on uh, medications development, and we were very pleased to see Probofine just approved by the FDA at the end of May, uh, and this was spearheaded by some major funding under the ARA funding. So with the, the Stimulus Act, just a few years ago with the economic downturn, we invested some of those funds in a large project to test the efficacy of Probofine, and that study was one of the pivotal trials that allowed it to be approved by the FDA just a few months ago. So with that, I'm very pleased to highlight for you just a few examples of how we think science can lead to solutions to address some of the most pressing addiction needs in our country, whether that's for my agency in particular, we think of the tobacco issues, e-cigarettes being an example, marijuana, the shifting social landscape, and of course, the opioid epidemic. Thanks very much. Okay, I have questions for you. Uh, according to the 2014 Monitoring the Future study, slightly more teens smoke cigarettes than use electronic cigarettes. True or false? Please stand up and salute once you have the right answer. Very good. Most of you got that right. It was worded in negative just to make it a little bit tricky for you. Next question. In the most recent data, more overdose deaths were due to heroin than prescription-type opioids. True or false? Most of you were able to recall that although there have been marked increases in heroin, there's still about half the number of deaths related to heroin than the prescription opioids. So even though the attention has shifted to uh, heroin, and certainly fentanyl, we need to be thinking about the prescription drugs all the time. Next. Secretary Burwell of the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services has selected the following as our opioid priorities, except opioid prescribing practices to prevent opioid disorders and overdose, better law enforcement identification of problematic opioid prescribers, expanded use of naloxone used to treat overdoses, and expanded use of medication-assisted treatment for opioid use disorders. Which one is not one of our department priorities? All right, thank you. Even though this is a priority across government, we're the Department of Health and Human Services, so we focus on the health issues primarily. I believe that's the last of the questions. Thanks very much. We're gonna take questions from the audience now. Uh, this first one is for uh, Kana. Tobacco is the number one cause of death in all alcohol and alcohol and all substance users. Why don't, why doesn't CSAT treatment, why don't CSAT treatment grants cover tobacco treatment? Um, that's an interesting. Oh, I think it's on. I, I, I had thought that most of our programs would permit that. Does someone have any experience where alcohol um, treatment of tobacco, uh, smoking uh, cessation was not covered in a grant or was not an allowable cost in one of our grants? Because I would have thought that it was. Uh, we certainly included on the mental health side. Okay. All right. 
Another question, this is a toss-up for anybody. <clears throat> is SBIRT effective for drugs other than alcohol and tobacco? If it isn't, why are we still teaching our students to do it? <clears throat> well, first off, when we think about what is SBIRT, this is a, it's not a single entity. Uh, SBIRT means screening, which is can we identify cases using standardized questions? The answer is yes, that's true for all the different substances. Have we proven that brief interventions are useful for illicit substances? The answer is no. We have mixed results. So we have a question when it comes to how best do we intervene, particularly for the non-addicted, non-substance uh, disordered population that are identified in screening. The third part is referral to treatment. So can we identify those who need treatment and engage them in care? That area has received the least attention and is in some ways some of the most important to address. So we need your help in coming up with better ways to address this for non-alcohol conditions. Okay. All right, Dr. Koob, can you give us any details about the Gabapentin initiative? The a uh, phase two clinical trial <clears throat> multi-center run by uh, our division of medications development has finished recruitment. The data should be in somewhere, I think, early next year, mid next year. All right, I uh, have another question for Dr. Koob. NIAAA has this initiative on rethinking drinking. What exactly is that? Well, rethinking drinking is just a website where you can find out what a standard drink is. You, there's a calculator there that'll tell you how many calories are in your favorite drink. It'll tell you how much alcohol is in your favorite drink. There are dose effect functions. There are referral to other websites if you're seeking treatment. There's just general in information about what is a blackout. All the kind of information that I've discovered in two and a half years as director of NIAAA, the American public does not know. Okay, all right. So I have another question for Dr. Koob. Um, you know, the literature has this, uh, several papers and even, uh, even some reviews on a J-shaped mortality curve for alcohol, and lately that's been refuted. What's the current thinking of whether or not there is a J-shaped mortality curve or whether, or whether that is, whether that is, uh, is subject to uh, further re uh, revision? The simple answer is it's complicated. It really depends. It really depends on what your dependent variable is. If you're, if you're measuring overall death, then uh, there is a controversy as to whether the J-shaped curve is real. If you're measuring heart disease or stroke or diabetes, there's pretty strong evidence out there, although some of it's still controversial, that there are beneficial effects of moderate drinking. I think some of you probably already know, but we have just started a moderate drinking trial that will be following two groups of subjects. One group will be receiving one drink a day and no more um, for three years, and the other group will be receiving no alcohol and will be charting their cardiovascular function, stroke, and other measures uh, 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 along this period. It's an area of, of it's fraught with a lot of problems because almost all the data uh, are not prospective studies. They're not longitudinal studies. They're, they're based on past correlations. This new study will be a prospective longitudinal study. Whether it'll put everything to rest is a good question. Um, so it, it, you know, I, I think that's the best I can summarize it without getting into the weeds. Okay, all right, thanks. The next one's for Kana. When will SAMHSA begin issuing waivers to nurses to practice, to prescribe buprenorphine? So I think we are still in conversation uh, with the department on how the implementation is gonna go of the MPPA, um, uh, the MPPA prescribing. I have buprenorphine. Um, uh, Mitra is here. I don't know if you want to say something about that. So we just had a meeting uh, on this. You, you have to use a microphone. <coughs> okay. So we just had a meeting on October 1st, um, and we heard uh, from a lot of stakeholders, heard from the community members. 
and um, we heard what their suggestions was, and we are putting all the information together to discuss with uh, uh, the department to come up with a plan that would be um, feasible, practical, and we heard a lot from the community that they wanted something rapidly, and we, we heard you, and we understand, and we will do our best uh, to get uh, the process going. Okay. Uh, next question for Connor. Actually, these are three questions about buprenorphine. We are all excited and appreciative of the waiver expansion to 275, but why not more? Um, well, this one has been pretty well litigated already, I think. But you know, I, um, the the when we went through the process of rulemaking, you know, we initially had it at 200, right? So we we uh, as a department, the secretary wanted to balance the need to increase access with the need to um, prevent diversion. And so we felt like, you know, we looked at the average number of, of um, patients seen by an opioid treatment provider, given all of the structure and the staffing and the oversight that's involved in an OTP, and uh, seeing that as somewhere between, I think, 300 and 400. Uh, the department landed on the number of 275 as, as one that we felt like uh, individual providers could manage safely, uh, effectively, uh, provide the quality of care that's necessary and reduce risk for diversion. Okay, so uh, will the, this number possibly increase, be increased at some point in the future? Would that be under consideration? We don't have any proposed rulemaking on the calendar, no. Okay, so the third question is, why wasn't SAMHSA given the oversight of buprenorphine instead of the DEA? <laughs> um, I, will, I will leave that question to, to uh, those who make those decisions. All right. <laughs> Above your pay grade, huh? Now that right. Way. Okay, this is for uh, George and Wilson. How will the results of the ABCD study help clinicians in practice? Well, the ABCD study may help in multiple ways. It may give us new targets for prevention studies or for medication development. As we learn more about the developmental processes that lead into first misuse, harmful use, and uh, addictive disorders, this could help us uh, with targeting, de developing new targets for medication development and uh, behavioral intervention, so that's number one. I also think in terms of the information that we need to communicate with our patients and with family members, understanding the interactions among use of different substances will be key. It turns out that, you know, of course as a scientist, I would like to know well, what's the impact of marijuana alone? I'd like to be able to answer that question. Well, that's not how our, our, the kids are using these substances. They're rarely using one by itself. So we need these large studies to help tease apart the relative impacts separately and together of the different substances. Okay. That's a short version that I hope will be useful to all of you all and certainly to policymakers as well. Okay. George, any further comment on that? Well, uh, simply that it's going to give you evidence-based information for decisions about some of the prevention that's already in place. And, and I would emphasize that uh, the, the evidence that we already have from preliminary data in this field is that the frontal cortex doesn't fully develop until mid-20s and that alcohol and maybe marijuana impact on that development. And I think we're gonna learn about that um, in, in a very uh, scholarly way. Okay. Another question for Wilson and George. Are NIDA or NIAAA funding any research on the effectiveness of telemedicine to treat addiction? Telemedicine. Certainly when it comes to opioid treatment, we're interested in distance models for supervising care. The ECHO model coming out of New Mexico is very promising in looking at other approaches that are similar to that. So there are variations on telemedicine that are undergoing some research right now. It is not a major part of our portfolio, but it's one, of course, we're interested in as a way of extending the expertise that you all have to clinicians who could benefit from your consultation but aren't in your immediate area, uh, or to patients who uh, live in remote areas. Those are some of the key obvious targets uh, for it. Okay. 
Okay. All right. Wilson, another one for you. What good is probufene when the cost is so great that it will not find widespread use? Well, there's always a question about the pricing of any new medications and how will that impact the access to care. There is so much, uh, uh, the, the, the retail price is not necessarily what the payer will pay if they negotiate through their pharmacy benefit managers, and it's not necessarily what patients will pay. So I would stay tuned for what it, the impact will be on your actual patient practices. Uh, and I will say that that is not part of the purview of the NIH development uh, process, but it is something we, of course, look at with sometimes with dismay, just like the rest of you. Okay. All right. Uh, Wilson, another question for you, and I'll uh, give George this, a similar question. What would be the next big breakthrough in treating opioid addiction? Well, that's a wonderful question. I'd love to be able to predict what our next big breakthrough in the treatment is. Uh, certainly an area that we're working very actively on are uh, uh, vaccine development, both for uh, uh, heroin as well as for fentanyl. There's a really interesting vaccine that's a combined HIV and heroin vaccine so that you might be able to address both the issues related to HIV infection and its co-occurrence in persons with heroin addiction, uh, both in the United States and internationally. I think that represents something that is at least in the in the not too distant future to learn whether or not these approaches will be useful. That's, that's one. I, I would think more broadly in terms of uh, uh, breakthroughs that could lead to some important prevention advances would be new treatments for pain. This is a major area, not just for NIDA, but all across the NIH. We have an over-reliance on opioids as the primary treatment for serious uh, 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 pain, uh, whether acute or chronic pain treatment and we'd like to come up with new approaches. So that's an area of active investigation that uh, either decoupling the uh, untoward effects of opioids, so the respiratory depression from the pain relieving approach, and or developing new, new treatments for pain. Those would be sort of the two. One, one is immediate for treatment, and the other one is a long-term prevention thinking. Okay, uh, this is for George. Uh, do we have any current medications that treat the binge intoxication part of, of uh, of the, the alcohol problem. Yeah, I mean, you would argue that naltrexone is <clears throat> a reasonably effective treatment for the binge intoxication phase of, of the cycle. And I mean, the, the, the lore is that naltrexone blunts the rewarding effects of alcohol and makes that second or third drink not particularly pleasurable. And <clears throat> this has uh, been verified in preclinical studies, but also clinical laboratory studies. There's another potential one which is being investigated at NIH and a few other labs, which is actually uh, one of your uh, hormones associated with stimulating appetite, which is ghrelin. And so there's a distinct possibility that ghrelin not only uh, stimulates your appetite for food, but maybe also your craving for alcohol. And some work by Lorenzo Leggio at the clinical center at NIH is uh, fully engaged in testing this hypothesis, so stay tuned. Okay. All right, there's one for Wilson. When will the Bupe versus naltrexone trial be completed? I'm sorry, I, I couldn't quite the, understand. The buprenorphine versus naltrexone trial. There's a trial apparently yeah. in the clinical, clinical trials network. The trials network is fielding a, 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 an effectiveness trial of comparing these two very different medications. Some of the issues is how do you develop sort of clinical equipoise in terms of a randomization when patients may be very interested in either agonist or antagonist treatment. They come in with their own preconceptions, so selecting patients who are willing to be randomized across those two groups is part of the complication. But our clinical trials network is currently uh, in the planning stages and, I, and uh, will be launching this trial very shortly. And I don't remember the exact dates, but okay. if you're interested, shoot me a, an email, I'll be happy to get you that information. Okay, another uh, question for, uh, for Wilson. Uh, what is NIDA researching in terms of developing medications to treat cocaine use disorder, methamphetamine use disorder, and cannabis use disorder? We don't have any medications for any of those disorders. Well, I was very pleased to see George, uh, Dr. Koob, put up a list of the promising targets for addictions across the whole spectrum. And uh, these are included some of the promising targets for stimulants of both types as, and uh, cannabis use disorders. 
Uh, certainly, we've been working with uh, a, a number of groups on medications for cannabis withdrawal, and we've seen some progress in that regard. But we've had some notorious difficulty in developing medications for stimulants and for cannabis use disorders. And I don't like to speculate when our next breakthrough will be because I, I, I was quite convinced that the enzyme uh, 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 therapy that Per, that enhanced the breakdown of cocaine, for example, which had very promising signals in the early trials, would be a success for us. And yet, in the larger scale clinical trials that were just recently completed, they did not reach their clinical endpoints. So this is an example of how difficult this field has been uh, to, to address stimulants and cannabis use disorders in particular. Okay. All right. Uh, question for George. Uh, what's the current status of a camprosate for treating alcohol dependence? A camprosate is uh, an FDA-approved medication for treating protracted abstinence and maintaining abstinence in alcohol use disorder. It has an effect size. Actually, it's better than naltrexone if you look at the meta-analyses, but it's an effect size. Both naltrexone and acamprosate have effect size that are close to uh, those of uh, uh, SSRIs for the treatment of major depressive episode. A lot of people don't realize that. Um, and one of the things we'd really like to see at NIAAA is that, that the physicians would understand that there are three FDA-approved medications for the treatment of alcohol use disorders, and they are effective. And there are meta-analyses, several of them that were published, 2014, 2015. These are reasonably unbiased. These are in very prominent medical journals, too, showing that these uh, drugs are effective across clinical trials in many different settings. Another question for George. Uh, Tapiramate is an approved FDA medication, uh, and it has shown efficacy in treating alcohol use disorders. Is there any push to try to get a tapiramate or, or a tapiramate analog to be approved by the FDA for alcohol use disorder? No. <laughs> um, we're, we're not pursuing tapiramate. I don't know of any pharmaceutical company that wants to pursue tapiramate. There are some fairly strong side effects associated with tapiramate. What is being pursued at NIAAA <clears throat> are the targets that tapiramate act on with the hope okay. of obtaining a medication that will be equally effective, but without the side effects. Okay, thank you. Uh, Wilson, will NIDA consider changing its name to avoid the term abuse? I think we just saw this week a, a, a really nice commentary in the Journal of the American Medical Association by Mike, Michael Botticelli, our, our director of the Office of National Drug Control Policy, and Howard Coase, the former Secret, Assistant Secretary of Health, emphasizing the importance of language and reducing this, the kind of automatic stigmatizing that, ha, sti, that can happen with the use of certain language. For example, when we talk about urine drug testing, we typically have been taught to talk about them as clean or dirty. Uh, those are stigmatizing terms. So why can't we switch to terms like, uh, you know, a positive urine drug screen or a negative urine drug screen, something more neutral? Certainly, the key focus will be to fo will be to develop person-centric language. So a person's with person with a substance use disorder or a person with addiction, rather than referring to somebody as an addict or a drug abuser if you're using DSM three three or four nomenclature. We have no plans to change our name. That requires congressional action. Okay. And also, I'm not sure that the name of an institute is particularly stigmatizing when it comes to the individuals that are affected by these conditions. Okay. All right, do we have any questions from the back? I think there's one more coming up. All right, and while I'm getting that question, there was one that was brought up. This is a bureaucratic question. Why are NIAAA and NIDA separate institutes? <laughs> Because they are. <laughs> because they are. Um, there are many unique aspects to alcohol because it's a legal drug and it has uh, profound effects on development. Fetal alcohol spectrum disorder is it causes about half of the liver toxicity in this country. Um, and so the, the wise decision that was made was <laughs> that NIDA and NIAAA would love each other, but we wouldn't get married. And so I, I think that has turned out to be a very successful enterprise. We do a lot of work together under the auspices of the collaborative research on addictions at NIH. 
And, you know, because of the structures of both institutes, there are people who are expertise, that have great expertise in these different areas. And I think it just works out a, a, in a human way a, a much easier to uh, integrate in that fashion. I, I would suggest that making sure that we have appropriate attention to the number one disease and public health causing substance, which is alcohol, uh, or arguably, you can, tobacco possibly, anyway, um, is essential, and that's why keeping them separate allows a continued focus on alcohol, while our responsibility covers a very broad range of substances at NIDA. Uh, one of the lessons coming out of the big move to, to consider whether we would form one institute uh, has been the, the, the need to make sure that we coordinate better. Now, the secret is many of us did coordinate and collaborate, make sure we didn't duplicate our efforts in many, many ways. But there have been places where we fell short of that, that uh, uh, challenge, and we're doing a better job now. All right. Uh, and with that answer, we are out of time. I would like to thank our speakers for their presentations. Next session will start. Dr. Khalsa is going to be the moderator for the session.